Hello Barnstormers. Today I want to talk to you a little bit more about our upcoming capstone. In a few minutes you'll see a video that's been produced by the headquarters IG and Senior Master Sergeant Creech and Senior Master Sergeant Wisdom will tell you more about what is contained within the AFIS program. I want you to know that we have been focusing on the four major areas that are in AFI 1-2 Commander's Responsibilities. That's execute the mission, manage resources, lead the people, and improve the unit. We have been doing just that since our midpoint two years ago. In the beginning of June, we will have our inspectors showing up on base to basically take a look at our overall program. I have basically gathered up through your commanders all the things that you've been doing well and some of the areas where we have for improvement so that I can align my self-assessment to what the IG will be looking at. I want all of our barnstormers to make sure that you have the opportunity to tell them what you're doing right, tell them what you're working on to improve the unit, manage the resources, leading the people, and making us a better unit. What I need you all to do is be able to make sure that as great barnstormers that you are ready and willing to participate in the discussions with the IG and remember customs and courtesies. In the end, we'll come out just fine and the 104th Fighter Wing will be effective and mission ready. Thank you. So I'm Senior Master Sergeant Ray Wisdom. I'm with ACC IG and I'm a CSIP inspector. I'm Senior Master Sergeant Joe Creech, also a CSIP inspector with ACC IG, and the intent of this video is to give wing IGs and wing commanders a better understanding from the top level uh, what CSIP is, how it can help them, and what some of the major elements are. All right, Sergeant Creech, what is CSIP? Essentially, it's a way for a wing to measure and execute AFI 1-2 commander's responsibilities. It is a device that will help improve readiness and compliance and discipline across the four major graded areas. So how does it exactly do that? How does CSIP do what you just said? Well, it gives all commanders at all levels the right information at the right time. There's two major parts of it. Uh, there's the wing inspection program and the unit self-assessment program. It allows, it allows commanders to be accountable and responsible for their own compliance and it allows the wing IG to validate and verify unit self-assessment programs and give an independent assessment of unit effectiveness. However, it will not work without command direction. So the wing commander has to take the helm of this, be actively engaged with the wing IG and all subordinate commanders. However, it won't work without the wing commander being engaged. This takes total buy-in from the, the wing commander and all subordinate commanders in order for it to, to properly be executed. Also, the wing commander has to promote a total culture of accurate and honest reporting. Uh, we call that embracing the red. So the commander owns CSIP, but who executes CSIP? Well, the wing IG executes CSIP, and the wing IGs in the wing IG office, which is staffed with the appropriate amount of people. Think of your IG as the, your agent of truth. They're going to bring you honest reporting. They're, they're not going to water anything down. They're going to just give you nothing but truth data. Wing IG offices are only partially funded right now but it is the responsibility of the wing commander to appropriately staff the wing IG office with the proper amount and qualities of personnel to make sure CSIP is executed effectively. So what would the typical size of a, an effective IG office be? We've seen them range from two to 12. Um, typically it's between four and six personnel for a successful CSIP. Um, but that's totally up to the wing commander and the, the mission of the unit. Some tenant wings don't require as large of a wing IG office, whereas most host installations have a little bit more work to do, so they do have a few more bodies in there. And of the people that you put in the wing IG office, they need to be some of your best airmen. You shouldn't try to hide people in that office because it's going to show. If, if that's your representative for the truth, you want it to be a, per, uh, a high caliber person in there. So Sergeant Creech, you mentioned unit self-assessment being a part of CSIP. What exactly is unit self-assessment? It's a means of internal assessment to, for squadron commanders to understand what risks are in the unit, the level of compliance in the unit, and what readiness looks like within that unit. It's led by unit commanders. It's a program that's led by them, not by the IG. And it requires that the unit commander and the self-assessment program manager 
are highly educated on what a self-assessment program is in order for it to, to be effective. They're kind of your key personnel there. Speaking of SAPMs, self-assessment program manager, uh, a SAPM is a lot more than just a MCT administrator. That's the person that is going to look at all your self-assessments and kind of capture all of that information. So is MCT the biggest part of unit self-assessment program? MCT is a self-assessment program of record, but it's definitely not the only part of, of self-assessment. And the reason why is because MCT typically is filled with self-assessment communicators, or SACs. Uh, a self-assessment communicator is not a checklist. It's only things that the HAF or MAGCOM functional area manager has deemed to be a risk across the entire enterprise. That's not a, a, a one-size-fits-all for everybody. It's not going to measure all your compliance items. It's only going to measure the things that the FAM is worried about. So what that leaves the commander is they have to figure out all the other compliance items that they should be doing and they should measure those as well and figure out where those high risk areas are. Another tool in, in MCT is the local checklists. Now that is a checklist, not a SAC, um, where they can be written at the wing level. So if a, if a unit determines they have an extremely high risk that they want to keep track of on a constant basis, they can write a local checklist for it. And it would go right along with the SACs that the, that the FAMs are seeing, but they wouldn't have visibility, the FAMs wouldn't have visibility on it. So going along with MCT, there are other ways that we've seen across the command that people are utilizing things that they're already doing and rolling that into their self-assessment program. Some of those other assessments are internal and external uh, inspections, uh, SAVs, when the, when the staff comes down to help a unit, um, quality assurance functions, stand eval, um, DOCs uh, for, that commanders get, meetings, personal observations, I mean, all kinds of stuff that people can use. Essentially, the commander is responsible for knowing the level of compliance, knowing the level of risk, and knowing the level of readiness in that unit. Whatever measures they have to take to understand that and to know that, that's what a self-assessment program is and that SAPM is going to be key in making that happen. Commanders need to make sure they're already capitalizing on the things that, they, that they're already doing. If they're already doing assessments, they need to capture that. In an effort for, in an effort for commanders and SAPMs to truly understand what they need to do, they need to be properly trained by the Wing IG. The commander's briefing and commander's training and the SAPM training that the Wing SAPM does uh, they, those all need to be very high quality. They need to understand exactly what's expected of them and how to get there. And that changes at every wing because of how uniquely tailored wings missions are and also how uniquely tailored self-assessment programs are. If a unit self-assessment program is so uniquely tailored, how do we ensure it's sustainable? Well, you gotta document it. Everybody has different ways of doing things, so it needs to be documented. There needs to be a policy or, or a TTP or, or some kind of local guidance that says, hey, this, this is how I do the self-assessment program in whatever unit you're in. When that, when that commander changes out and now a new commander has to formulate their self-assessment program, it gives them a starting point as opposed to just starting with MCT and trying to figure it all out. At the end of the day, Good self-assessment programs are going to reduce undetected non-compliance. That's the whole point of this. You can't ma properly manage your risk unless you know what your risk is. So self-assessment is going to let them know what their risk is so that commanders can make data-driven decisions on how to actually manage that risk. So AFI 1-2 and 9201 are pretty vague. How do unit commanders know what to do in their wing? Well, the wing IG has to write really good business rules. Um, obviously the requirement out of 9201, again, a very vague document, says that you have to have MCT and iGEMS business rules, but successful CSIPs within ACC have always had a couple of things in common, and one of those is having really good business rules. What business rules is going to do is it's going to set out roles and responsibilities, and it's going to lay out clear expectations for commanders and SAPMs and all the members of the Wing IG office, even the Wing Commander. It's going to make sure they understand what's expected of them, 
and it's, it's going to give the Wing IG a method to measure that unit when they're validating self-assessment programs on horizontals and verticals. Another way to spread that understanding is to educate the populace. Educate your entire wing beyond the commanders. Ensure that culture of honest, accurate reporting is alive and well and healthy within your wing. And continuing, uh, uh, having a robust wing inspection team with the proper subject matter experts and the appropriate number to accomplish the inspections that you need to accomplish uh, is, is also very, very important. You're going to use those WIT to do the two main functions of the wing inspection program, which is to independently assess the unit and to validate and verify unit level self-assessment programs. Tell me a little bit about the annual inspection plan. Well, it's created by the wing IG, but it has to be approved by the wing commander. It's, it's the wing commander CSIP, and the wing commander has to approve whenever any of those, those resources are being utilized. It's going to provide a reliable assessment of the wing based off of the wing commander's direction. So your minimum requirements for the annual inspection plan is attachment two out of 9201. That's gonna be your bylaws and your exercises. Once you build those into your annual inspection plan, you're gonna build in some additional areas. You're gonna have areas of high risk, um, whatever the com wing commander has determined is gonna be a concern or a focus area. Um, perhaps it's a PT program or or something like that that's a horizontal across the wing. If that's a high interest area, high risk area to the mission, that might be something you want to validate as a wing IG. And then you're also going to try to throw in one or two no notices, maybe more if, if that's how you want to operate, and horizontals and verticals. Uh, horizontals being your programmatic looks across the wing and verticals being within the chain of command of one's, one particular unit. Now when you're looking at units through a vertical lens, you're not going to be able to look at every compliance item. You're going to have to figure out what items you're going to need to look at within that specific unit that are risky as well. So once the plan is built, can it change? Well, absolutely. The annual inspection plan is best served as a living document. You don't want anything to just project out 12 months and expect that the risk is going to be the same from 12 months ago. So the more it can flex and the more white space it has to, to move things around, the more the wing will be able to properly utilize it. The one takeaway though for an annual inspection plan is that it is risk-based. It's not calendar-based. Build it off a of risk. If you put an inspection out there, you need to understand why you put that inspection out there. It needs to have risk tied into it. So how does the wing know the risk areas to build into the plan? The annual inspection plan is going to get fed by the RBSS or risk-based sampling strategy. Essentially what that is is a collection of data points that for the most part are objective as they can be and it's going to start pointing the way or pointing towards high risk areas. And by high risk I mean highest, highest risk to the mission and the highest risk of undetected noncompliance. Again, undetected noncompliance. You can't manage risk unless you know risk. You know what your risk is. A good RBSS is going to have a whole bunch of inputs, self-assessment program data, information from the CIMB, readiness reporting, uh, DOX, training indicators, uh, perform any other kind of key performance indicators. Um, but the main focus is the wing commander's concerns. Whatever the wing commander's worried about is what the IG should be worried about. That's the, that goes from the vision and mission statement down to priorities and then focuses and concern, specific concern areas um, from 100 meter targets all the, way out, uh, all the way up to five meter targets. And essentially, when you can figure out which units are the highest risk of risk to the mission and risk of undetected noncompliance, you can start to uh, evaluate and inspect those units and validate self-assessment programs that those commanders are doing what they're supposed to do. So after a wing conducts the annual inspection plan and they, they execute an inspection, how do they capture that data? Well, they're going to capture it with reports and iGEMS. Um, all inspections have to be planned, conducted, and reported in iGEMS. But a report is not just a list of deficiencies. That's, that's not serving anybody any justice. A report should tell a story. It should tell why we're inspecting this unit. 
Uh, it should tell what the high risk areas are based off of our RBSS. Um, and it should also tell the goods and the bads. Um, it should focus on either an independent assessment of, of the unit's effectiveness, or it should focus on validation of self-assessment programs at that unit level. Essentially, the Wing IG is validating that the self-assessment program is able to detect its own non-compliance within it. So it could focus on either one of those or it could focus on both of those. But the important part is that, is that all of that is captured in the report. So, the, so that the wing commander knows, hey, we did a vertical on the CE squadron. Um, the squadron commander has a pretty good self-assessment program because they wrote to it. They can say, right here on this piece of paper is where it said that the squadron commander has a pretty good grasp on what's going on. That's going to validate all that information that they're going to hear through the IG channel and the CIMB. So what about staff assistant visits? Do those go into IGENs? So really it's kind of up to the commander. It's, it's up to the wing commander. It's up to the wing IG on how they want to document SAVs. If you do elect to put SAVs in IGEMs, it needs to be to help with deficiency management. It's going to give you a way to track those deficiencies to closure with all of the built-in things that IGEMs does for you like uh, estimated closure dates, uh, corrective action plans, um, deficiency cause codes. It allows you to use a system that's already out there for uh, essentially what was a, an external inspection. But if you do put stuff into iGEMS from SAVs, uh, you need to upload the report from the SAV as well. So you would open an inspection, load in any deficiencies or strengths that they had, um, and then upload the report as well. Let's talk about the Commander's Inspection Management Board. Is it just a meeting? What makes it different from any other meetings? So it's not just a meeting. It's, it's a board. It's a process. Um, it's, it's a slide deck and a conversation. It's, it's not just talking about all the stuff that we did in the past. It's trying to look forward, kind of like a crystal ball, to tell you what risks you have and how they could impact the wing. It's Inspection Management Board. It's not just a meeting. We're going to talk about health and readiness and compliance at that meeting. That's where all that data is synthesized from CSIP inspections. Also, you're, we're going to get some wing commander direction um, for the IG and for subordinate commanders on how the wing commander wants to assess those units or wants them to assess themselves through the self-assessment program. And it's, it's not going to be, the better you get out of CIMB, the more it looks forward than looks in the past. It's, it's not about here's what we did, it's about here's what we should do. Again, it's a process. It's not just a meeting. It's more than slides. It's that conversation as well. Um, some people that are gonna, going to have to be at the CIMB is the wing commander, uh, WSA chiefs, uh, group commanders, squadron commanders, some wings we even see SAPMs um, coming to them, and the IG is going to orchestrate it, but it's going to be led and chaired by the wing commander. There are some requirements for the CIMB um, out of 9201. You do have to have a commander's dashboard, and we get a lot of questions about what a commander's dashboard actually looks like. Um, of all the units that have commander's dashboards, I've rarely seen one that looks exactly like another. It's, it's a tailored list of metrics that the wing commander values. So it can be anything from deficiency management stuff to a list of trends to top five priorities for the wing uh, to grading out the four MGAs from the wing commander. It could be anything. Essentially what a wing IG should be able to do with a dashboard is they should be able to put the dashboard up and give the status of CSIP and wing health readiness and compliance off of that one slide. It's, a, it's your one pager essentially. Another thing that has to be at the CIMB, has to be included in the CIMB, is your key deficiency review. Um, what's a key deficiency? Again, it's up to the wing commander. So uh, some, some consider SIGs and CRITs key deficiencies. Some consider bylaw deficiencies key deficiencies. Um, some consider readiness key deficiencies all the way down to minors. Um, so another thing is upcoming events. Uh, this could be deployments. This could be calendar items. Um, this could be an air show, anything that's coming up on the calendar that the IG would need to know about. Um, Air Force Audit Agency findings has to be in the CIMB. 
and group commander objectives and feedback. This is where the group commander is going to essentially give their top five concerns. And these are not necessarily things that are in MCT or things that are in iGEMS. These are concern areas that, you know, they're things that are keeping the commander up at night. What's the commander really worried about that's going to impact the mission, impact, you know, compliance and readiness? And then the wing commander is going to do the same thing. Essentially give direction to the wing IG and direction to those units based off of all the input, the information and input that he's gotten from those uh, commanders and self-assessment programs and kind of what we do next, where we're going from here. Do we need to change the RBSS? Do we need to change the wing inspection plan? Do we need to hit something else this quarter instead of whatever was planned now? So what does the commander do with all this information? So they can do a lot with that information, but the overall end product of CSIP is a commander's inspection report or a CCIR. And who is the audience for the CCIR? It's from the wing commander to the MAGCOM commander. There's some folks in between uh, NAV commanders. If you're in the guard, then you're going to have to go through the NGB IG and a few other folks. But essentially what it is, is it's the wing commander's assessment of readiness and compliance in the wing. Now something important to state about this. This is not a press release. This is not how awesome we have been. This is going to talk about all your successes. This is going to talk about your resource constraints. This is going to talk about your big rocks that are getting in the way of you doing your mission. This is kind of where you ask for help if you need to ask for help directly from the MAGCOM commander. If you need a template for the CCIR, it is on the SAF IGI or SAF IG SharePoint. So what about all the other units that rely on another unit to help with their inspection requirements? How do, how do they ensure that those requirements are being met? So you're probably talking about bylaws or exercises. So let's, let's go over those first and then we'll talk about some of the other requirements. Bylaws, essentially if we want to understand the intent of a bylaw, it is a service that an airman should have and it's directed by Congress and we have to do annual inspections on those for the most part uh, annual inspections on those. If you don't own that program then you don't have to do the bylaw for it. Well tenant unit's not responsible for conducting the the bylaw inspection however they're, re they're responsible for the airmen that receive that service. Absolutely they have they have a responsibility to that airman. That wing commander, whether it's a tenant unit or not, or if it's a GSU or not, that wing commander has a responsibility to make sure that service is available to that airman. If that service is, it, service is available through a host tenant support agreement, that's awesome that they have the service there. The annual inspection is still due. If that host unit is gonna do their own inspection, it would be in the commander's best interest to make sure that they're kind of involved in that uh, so they can make sure that that service is adequate for their airmen. The best way to do that is with a memorandum of understanding. Spell out exactly which bylaws are going to get done and by who and make sure that program manager support for tenant units is built into those inspections. Also in the bylaw reports making sure that you mention that particular unit, that tenant unit in the host installation bylaw report is crucial to them getting credit for that wing commander to get credit that that service is available for that airman and it's adequate. Same thing goes with exercises. If you don't own the host base, you're probably not going to be putting together too many installation assurance type exercises. But your airman should still play in those whenever possible because the intent of those inspections is to make sure that airmen can react a certain way in a given situation. Active shooter, FPCON measures, uh, continuity of operations exercises, that still pertains to every airman. Uh, those situations don't care if that airman is a tenant unit or not. So being able to functionally operate in those situations is what you're getting tested for in those exercises. So tenant unit commanders need to make sure that their airmen are staying engaged with the host base, again, through memorandums of understanding. And lastly, if you are a tenant unit that's mentioned in a host unit's report, make sure you get a copy of that report and you upload it into your wing's iGEMS to, to gain full credit for that. So how can we gain some efficiency from some of this CSIP data? Through the waiver process. It's going to enhance effectiveness and preserve resources while also safeguarding health and welfare. 
when you find something that you're unable to comply with or that just doesn't make sense for you to comply with, you can do a non-compliance waiver, absolutely. They can be temporary or permanent, and if you want more guidance on that, it's AFI 33360, and the Air Force form is this Air Force Form 679. All of the tiered waiver guidance in all of the AFIs, tier zero, tier one, tier two, tier three, those are the line items that are typically waived. Uh, tier three can be waived by the wing commander, and the wing commander can even delegate that down to squadron command. Tier two can be waived by the MAGCOM commander, and our MAGCOM commander has delegated that down to the first GO in the chain. Tier one, which can be approved by the MAGCOM commander, but COMAC has delegated that down to the directorate director. Tier zero is a requirement that is levied on us outside of the Air Force or by the SECAF. That can only be waived by that originating entity. Um, if you want to do a waiver against Tier Zero, submit it to the half publication OPR, and they will consider it to be pushed out uh, outside of the Air Force channels. So what does the unit commander do once the waiver's been approved? They're going to give it to the IG. Uh, as soon as they draft it, it doesn't have to be approved. It can, you know, as soon as they start routing it up, give it to the IG. Um, they need to use this for a piece of their risk-based sampling strategy as well. And once it's approved, you need to send a copy to the OPR of that publication that you're waiving. They use this to make decisions off of. They want to see what's being waived within their publications. So to close, the intent of this conversation is to, to give some MAGCOM IG level interpretation to some of the wings that maybe aren't very clear on some of this. Um, to restate, the wing commander is very important here. The wing commander has to be involved. They need to be steering the ship. You can't have a CCIP without the CC. And in those units where the commander's not very engaged, we can see it. We can see it from four months out when we do our risk-based sampling strategy. Um, so make sure the wing commander is engaged. Additionally, Self-assessment programs are 75% of this. All of those subordinate commanders need to execute their programs, train them correctly, set clear expectations for them, and measure, those expect measure them up against those expectations. That's 75% of the work in CSIP. And then the Wing IG goes out and validates what they're doing. A good place for Wing IGs to get resources is the ACC IG collaboration page. There's a lot of good resources and examples from other wings on there, um, as well as the self-assessment program videos that Lieutenant Colonel Mike Bliss did um, a while back. So that's another good piece for training as well. If any of the commanders has any kind of questions for, for us, they can always get a hold of their deputy team chief and, and ask their deputy team chief to get them to link them up with a CSIP inspector, and they'll absolutely do that.